Have you ever seen a molecule like this and wondered? Hmm, I wonder what it means. Or maybe you've just been thinking to yourself, as people do, why does carbon appear so often in chemistry? Or maybe you've just clicked on the video because you found the thumbnail interesting, which I highly doubt. No matter the reason, by the end of this video you will not only understand the skill to notation, but also what organic chemistry is all about, and why the notation can get so... confusing at times. And so without any further ado, it's time that I show you... Okay, so the intro side, yes, was at the end of this video you will not only understand what these curtains mean, but also why these molecules have this specific structure. Uh, this is an organic chemistry video after all, so if you want to leave and give up on the topic, go right ahead, I won't stop you. I get it, I really do, I won't blame you, I'll give you a second. Okay, so now that the only mentally deranged are left, I think we can start with some background physics. Consider these three facts like the anesthesia before the operation. First, we have energy. So what is energy? Well, that's a bit of a long story, but the basic idea is there are two ways you can think about energy. The change and the lack of stability. So kinetic and potential. Kinetic means change. This is because things with energy move a lot, and if you move a lot, then you're more likely to hit something. And if you hit something, you're gonna lose that energy. That's why things with a lot of energy want to lose that energy. Potential means lack of stability. So if we have a stack of cubes and if we just... Then yeah, that, that, that releases energy. Actually, a better way to represent this, which I'm definitely not picking because of it's self-simulating, I can just kill it on a single axis, is a spring. That's because for a spring, if you compress it, it will have a lot of potential energy, and as you slowly let go, it releases that energy until it has no more energy to release. And at that point, you have to add energy by pulling it away. The same thing goes for the electrons in the atoms. So just to pick a random atom, which will definitely not be a foreshadowing for the rest of the video, if you have a, let's just say, a carbon atom, all right? That's kind of like our spring squished to the extreme. If we add a hydrogen, it's going to bond, which is kind of like releasing that energy just a little bit. And as we keep adding hydrogens, it's releasing more and more until it has no more energy to give. And so if you add an additional hydrogen, that's kind of like stretching the spring. So you need to add energy. And the first time it gets the chance, it will try to get back. That's why methane is stable, but methanium is unstable. But we don't talk about methanium. Next we have the fact that atoms are a real thing. Yes, ever since John Atom, an old pal of mine, created the first atom, they have indeed been physical objects. Can confirm, I use them every day. That really often gets underappreciated, so while so far on this channel I've only discussed orbitals in terms of energy, it's important to remember that they are actual physical objects that exist in our space. Basically, our brains evolved to interpret the world on our scale, so if you see a chair, you understand what a chair is, but our brains didn't evolve to understand the world on the quantum scale. That's why we're having trouble imagining quarks, or wave particle duality, or the uncertainty principle, like all of these are difficult to understand not because they are illogical, only because we're not used to understanding them. Atoms, however, are large enough so we can start thinking of them as physical objects. For example, sigma bonds can rotate, pi can't. Why? Well, this is what s orbitals look like. This is what p orbitals look like. Now, if s orbitals come head-on, they form the sigma bond, which looks like this. When p orbitals, however, come not head-on, they form the pi bond, like this. Now, you can see that if you rotate a sigma bond, then it's the same thing. It doesn't really change. If you rotate a pi bond, however, you can see that you need to break it and reform it. And that's the actual reason of why sigma bonds can rotate and pi bonds can't. But funny enough, if you get a double pi bond, it merges together into this donut shape, which, yes, 
can rotate because it's a donut. Make it, what are you talking about? I mean, we're all taught in schools that these can't rotate. Like, oh no, no, it's actually true. Right here, you can see the source saying that they can rotate. And that basically, yeah, but there's this another source which says that they actually can't rotate. Actually, I have this graphic here. Where, no, but with all seriousness, I have sources saying that it can rotate and I have sources saying that it can't. So if there's a chemist watching this video right now that could point me to some kind of paper in, you know, uh, which in some way checks if they actually can or can't rotate, I would, I would really appreciate it a lot. And then the last thing, which is that whilst we do have the standard model, we have particle physics, we have the Schrodinger's equation, atoms are already too large for us to use these tools. So for example, if you'd like to figure out how the helium atom works perfectly, then you need to account for the six quarks in neutrons, three quarks per proton, two electrons, quark interacts through color charge, strong interaction spinning over into the nuclear interaction, electromagnetic interaction between atoms, between quarks, between electrons and quarks, between quarks and electrons, the weak interaction, the interaction with all the atoms, the other particles, also poly inclusion principle is there, what about quantum numbers, remember to conserve the lepton number, or what about spin uncertainty principle, we don't know a bell theorem, what's that, I'm sorry, I'm too busy downloading principal mathematics, Editing a random character and spreading in a line. So the point I'm trying to make here is that I won't be able to give you my usual quantum reasons for why these molecules exist the way they do. Not because these reasons don't exist, only it's a lot of quantum. And actually, that is it. That's all the physics we're gonna need in order to get into... Alright, so first things first, let's talk carbon. Carbon is an atom, but it appears everywhere in organic chemistry, so why carbon? How carbon? Which carbon? What carbon? What is a carbon? Carbon is an atom, you've really got to pay attention, honestly, I said it like a second ago. Okay, so what is it about carbon that makes it appear everywhere? Well, two things, mostly, stability of bonds and catenation. What is catenation? Well, it basically means that carbon can bond with itself to make a chain Th that's what this chapter is about this change chapter now things bonding with themselves isn't that weird in chemistry consider all the gases but what makes it special for carbon is that carbon can hybridize otherwise called voodoo magic remember how a while back ago i made this video in which i explained the physical reason for chemical reactions the one in which i explained that electrons have a certain discrete number of shapes they can be in so for example s shape which looks like this p shapes which look like this and nothing in between well hybridization is what happens when electrons achieve the shape in between these two wait a second make it didn't you just say that you can't have any shape in between these two yes Okay, so there are two explanations to hybridization, the organic one, the quantum one. The quantum one is this equation, which, I mean, it's not all that complex, and for anyone wondering, right here, you can think of it as physicists treating the orbitals as one-fourth of the hybridized one, instead of treating the hybridized as four different orbitals, and so now they are no longer eigenstates of the angular momentum operator, and you have to trust me at this point that this sentence is actually simple and explains it pretty well. I'll make a video about quantum mechanics soon enough, so just watch that video when it comes out and get back to this one, and you'll see that that sentence is actually not as bad as it seems and actually explains it. And so after this one, we have the organic explanation, which is that when carbon bonds with four things, they all want to be as far from each other as possible, which results in this shape. And so when carbon bonds with four hydrogens, that is the shape it will create, with all hydrogens being as far as possible. But the fun thing there is the fact that you can replace one of these hydrogens with another carbon. Now, the carbon is really unstable when bonded with just one thing. That's why in order to make it more stable, we can give it its own hydrogen. And another one. And yet another one. Because carbon is most stable when bonded to four things. And then we can just replace one of these hydrogens with a carbon. And another. And another. And you can keep going forever. And that is where we get the carbon chain. But before we get to these advanced, complex, fun skeletons, we need to start simple. So we will start with the simplest possible. That is, a dot. What does this dot mean? Well, a dot means a carbon atom. The only problem being that the carbon atom is incredibly unstable by itself. That's why you need to add one, two, three, and four hydrogens to make it perfectly stable. Now, this dot can represent five atoms at once because it's actually only there to represent the carbon. We can just assume the hydrogens to be there. Same thing goes if we extend the dot into a line. Now, this line means two carbons, six hydrogens that they are attached to. 
I really hope it makes sense so far, basically unless you specify otherwise by adding a double bond for example, every carbon is bonded to four things, and unless you specifically know what it's bonded to, we just assume it's hydrogen. So in a molecule like this, each one of these three dots means a carbon. Now first carbon is only bonded to one thing, another carbon, so we need to add three more hydrogens. Second carbon is bonded to two other carbons already, so we need to add two hydrogens. And the third one again is bonded to one, so three remaining. And that's how we can represent propane. Why propane, you ask? Well, it's because of two parts. Prop basically means three carbons, and ane means kind of like a plain chain. All these parts of the names will be replaceable, so for example we can replace prop with any other number. So scaling up we have meth f prop but pent hex hept oct non same prefix the deck and that's where I'll finish off. You could go on like this but I don't think you need to know how many isomers icosahectane has. And before any jokers in the comments pointed out yes, if you want a chain with one carbon that is methane. And that's not just a funny coincidence, that is where meth gets its name, which is kind of hilarious when you think about it, considering how common the word meth is in organic chemistry. It, it really just means one carbon alkane, basically. And for some reason, we just associate it with like that extremely complicated molecule. But putting that aside, this allows us to create alkanes. Next, we can complicate it even more, but adding the word cyclo. So this is pentane. You can see it's pent, so five carbons, and ane, so a chain. But if we instead take a look at the cyclopentane, we see it's a ring. Yup, that's what cyclo means. So hexane, cyclohexane, heptane, cycloheptane, and so on and so forth. And yes, I am just trying to flex my cool geometry nodes, which I just made for this one video. And no, they weren't all that difficult to make at all. Okay, now we can look at something near and dear to my heart. Alcohol, or ethanol to be more exact. Wait a second, make it. Ethanol? Eth. Does that have anything to do with the number 2 ethane? That is a phenomenal question, and the answer is, yeah, it's actually the same thing. The only difference is that for ethane, it's an ane, meaning just a simple chain. For ethanol, we have all, so a functional group of oxygen hydrogen. And as scary as it may sound, functional groups are just different compounds that appear all the time. Here you can see a table with some of them, and look! That's the alcohol, right there. You can see that it's an oxygen hydrogen and it has a suffix all. It really is that simple. F, two carbons, all oxygen and hydrogen. With the hydrogens to cap them off. Okay, so now that we're past the baby level naming convention, time to switch up from casual chemistry to competitive. And so for that, I'm going to pepper your screen with the absolutely heinous looking ethane 112 tricarboxylic acid. <laughs> or actually, is it heinous looking? That's because carboxylic acid is just a functional group. This functional group, to be exact. Tree means three. Ethane describes this chain in the middle, and 112 are just the coordinates of the functional groups. You see, when we name different carbon chains, we start by selecting the longest one attached to the most senior functional group. Then we find the functional group with the highest priority, and we index these carbons and add the coordinates. So for example, in a molecule like this, we first start with the longest chain attached to the functional group. So we already know that it's going to be something butany, because there are four carbons. Next, the functional group of just oxygen, which adds the suffix of al. So this right here is butanol, but we have additional reg right here at the bottom. So what is it? Well, if it was a lone carbon, then it would be called methane. One carbon and four hydrogens. But this one doesn't have four hydrogens, it has three. That's why it's not methane, only methyl. So methyl butanol, with a 2 before methyl because it's on the second carbon. And with that in mind, you can see that we could just modify it to change up the molecule. We can turn it into the 2 methyl pentanol, 2 methyl hexanol, 2 methyl heptanol, 2 methyl heptanol, 3 methyl heptanol, 3 ethyl heptanol, 3 propyl heptanol, 3 butyl heptanol, 3 pentyl heptanol. No! Wrong! That's because for a free pentyl heptanol, this is no longer the longest chain. This is the longest chain, meaning that now it is free butyl octanol, like this. 
I won't go too much in depth about how and when to start indexing them because IUPAC Blue Book is available for free. And I don't want this to be just a three hour long video about magical runes and every now and then broken up by an occasional game of spot the difference. But the basic idea is functional groups have seniority. So basically, carboxylic acid is the most senior. Alcohol is lower down the line. We start with the most senior functional group from which we try to make the longest chain and then we just attach the additional ones. So right here we have decade, adding the carboxylic acid, meaning it's decanoic acid. And then we just index them from the functional group back. So right here we can see that we have methanol on the fifth carbon and carbaldehyde on the seventh, meaning five methanol, eight al decanoic acid. Or rather five methanol, eight methyloxo decanoic acid, or, or eight methyloxo, five methyl hydroxy decanoic acid. That's because of stuff. And here I suppose it would be a good time for a quick recap, just to remind ourselves of everything we've learned so far. First of all, carbons have this fun property where they can form chains with hydrogens to kind of cap them off. Based on this property, we have the field of organic chemistry. So chemistry that deals with all the compounds based on these carbon chains. Because we know that all these molecules would be based on carbon chains, we have a naming convention centered around them, where for basic alkynes, we have the methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane, hexane, and so on and so forth. Then onto these chains, we can attach different functional groups. So basically different atoms or tiny molecules that are not simple carbon chains. Now, when we name an organic molecule, we start with the functional group of the highest seniority. Like in this case, the carbon nitrile is senior to carbaldehyde. So our most senior chain is capped with the suffix nitrile, not al. From there, we start the indexing of the molecule and then we can just note it all down. There, that is the full process with a couple of notable asterisks to mention, but I'm not gonna mention them. You see, the point here is that even though I find IUPAC amazing and absolutely outstanding, it still seems to have a lot of flaws. So going back to our previous big molecule, I've given you three different names for it. That's because I thought the first one was the correct one, but after I've shown it to someone who actually knows a thing or two about organic chemistry, they gave me the third one. That's because even though technically there could be different names made for a single molecule, IUPAC always tries to create one that's preferable, just to create a standard. Now, creating a preferable name may seem like a simple process, but it's not. It means that you'll have to name a lot of unique shapes in unique ways. For example, hexane looks like this, but it's different from cyclohexane, which is different from benzene, which is different from phenyl, which is different from pyridine, which is different from piperidine, which is different from pyrazine, which is different from benzodioxine, which, although this one at least makes a little bit of sense, which is different from naphthalene, which is different from quernine, and I could keep going. IUPAC tries to balance the rigor of the naming convention with thousands of conventions that are already in place, with the complexity of organic chemistry, with the exception that always inevitably pop up and the convenience for us to understand. And that's why it's so difficult and that's why it seems to have a lot of flaws while in reality it's doing the best it can. That is the gist of it. And now I hope that if you see an organic molecule in the wild you will understand what it means. Now that you know the secret to decoding organic molecules. But that was all just a formality, you see. I had to go over the basics, like carbon and IUPAC, in order to actually get to the fun stuff, like how different builds of molecules and functional groups can actually affect the molecules. And that extremely interesting topic starts with the... No, oh, whoops. <laughs> that's, that's my alarm. You see, recently I'm trying to do YouTube full-time, uh, so to not starve to death, I need to do weekly uploads, and my time is up for this upload, so I guess that would be... That'll be a story for the next chemistry video in two to four weeks. Uh, anyhow, special thanks to Flame for getting me through chemistry. I'm not a chemist, and without Flame, I'll still be stuck talking about particle physics. Uh, still, if I've got anything wrong in this video, that's my fault, not Flame's. I am still not a chemist, that's on me. Also, thanks to my Patreons! I really do appreciate it. Uh, that's not a joke about trying to do YouTube full-time, and I'm struggling financially. So, if you'd like to join me on Patreon, I would really appreciate that. And also... I have a Discord server, if you'd like to chat with me, with some special Patreon-only Discord channels. And also I stream every single day for charity, a series of live streams called Charity Checkups. Right now we're collecting money for Charity Prevent Cancer Foundation, and I'd really recommend you check it out. Anyhow, for now, that'll be it. Thank you everyone so much for watching, and have a great day. Bye.